Morning, everybody. Wonderful to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. Let's say good morning to our uh, friends on media, uh, radio, and the internet. Here we go. One, two, three. Good morning, media friends. All the people, there's a lot of people that take advantage of that, and it's a wonderful use of, of technology. Before I forget, last night uh, we could not get audio from the video from the, the kids' video or from the Wells connection. I don't know if Mr. Brown. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brown is up there. All right, here we go. So 22nd, 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. Come on in, Spreemans. Don't mean to put you in the spotlight, but you are. Sorry. <laughs> you don't need to wait for me. <laughs> it's always good to have the... Yeah. Well, good morning, Miles. Yeah. Um, 22nd Sunday after Pentecost is, is where we're at for the church here. We're way towards the end of the church here. <clears throat> that... Next Sunday will be Reformation Sunday, uh, the end times, and then in, you know, in a matter of a few weeks, we're, we're going to be hitting Advent and, and preparing hearts for birth of a Savior. But tail end, tail end of a church year, 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, and focusing on the word great, what it means to be great, uh, the definition of greatness in the world around us is, is 180 degrees opposite of what Scripture tells us, what God tells us about greatness, that, that greatness for the Christian, uh, greatness of Jesus Christ, right, is all wrapped around humility of service. And, and so that's what we look at and focus on for this morning, this 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. Everything for our worship is in your hard copy or up on the screen. Top of page 3 is where we get started here, so let's begin. We begin our worship in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship our triune God because he has accomplished everything for our salvation. O Lord, use my heart, my mind, and my mouth. So that I may give you the praise and glory you deserve. Be with us this morning as we've gathered in your holy name. Dear friends in Christ, may the Lord and all his blessings be with you. Pastor, may he also be with you. Thank you. In Christ we are all children of God through faith. For all of us who are baptized in Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. Galatians 2, 16 and 27. Jesus teaches us in his Sermon on the Mount, you are the salt of the earth. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. And the grace of the Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. The Apostle Peter writes, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And the Apostle Paul writes, As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. And again, Paul commands us, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. get started with that him 490 
please stand. As we confess our sins, let us remind ourselves of God's holy commands, which guide the behavior we are to show both to God and the people around us. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, workers, animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Having just reviewed these Ten Commandments and as baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
seated. Our first scripture lesson this 22nd Sunday after Pentecost comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Very familiar words that we hear, hear quite often. And again, to keep the context in mind, to keep this theme of what is greatness in God's kingdom is, is humility, is service. And you think about that one perfect example of perfect selfless service of Jesus Christ. Isaiah is, is talking about this, prophesying Jesus Christ some 700 years into the future. Someday that Messiah is going to come. And every time I read through this, it always strikes me to see how certain Isaiah is of that promise of God. He's so certain of it when you go through and read all those verbs that talk about something happening 700 years in the future. Grammatically speaking, you'd think, oh, he's going to use a future tense, right? Jesus will come in the future. But you talk about this Savior Jesus Christ. He is so certain he uses the past tense. He, he knows his sins are forgiven through that, that <coughs> sacrifice that will come into the future. So greatness, greatness through Jesus Christ. Isaiah is certain of it. Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's the end of our Old Testament lesson. Let's give our attention to the choir.
Thanks, choir. Thanks for all the work. Thanks for sharing your talents with the rest of us. The world, right? The WWW. Wonderful thing. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel of St. Mark. We're talking about greatness, right? You see how James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, fall into that temptation of what is great and, and trying to fit in the world's definition of being great. They see this Jesus guy and all the miracles, the incredible things he does. Boy, it'd be good to get on that bandwagon, and boy, we want positions of authority when Jesus finally takes control. And, and Jesus just turns at the table. He, he talks about becoming a slave, becoming a servant, serving people instead of this, this idea of position of authority. Again, that perfect example of Jesus and what is greatness, humble service. Mark 10. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? What's he talking about? Drink the cup I'm going to drink, his suffering and death. Can you do that? James and John? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom, for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's the end of our gospel lesson. Let's join in confessing our Christian faith towards the bottom there of page 7. I believe in the one true God who reveals himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He created everything that exists out of nothing in six days. He sustains and provides for his created world. I believe in Jesus Christ, God the Son, who came to earth to live the perfect life that I could not. I know that he was the complete sacrifice for my sin. He died so that I might live. He rose from the grave victorious over sin and death, guaranteeing that all my sins are forgiven. He left this earth visibly, went up into heaven, and now rules with all power and authority because he is God and his work on this earth is finished. He will come again one day as judge to finally defeat his enemies and to bring believers to live with him forever in heaven. I believe in God the Holy Spirit who has brought me to faith and made me God's child and an heir of eternal life. Now he pleads to the Father on my behalf, strengthens me when I am spiritually weak, and empowers me for service to my loving Savior, Jesus. All this he does through the gospel, God's word and sacraments. God's word points me to my need for a Savior and to his saving love for me. I believe the Bible is the true word of God, which teaches and guides me now to live for him because of all the things my God has done for me. We sing our next hymn, 362.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, I've been blessed with relatively good health, and it took a few years for me to really get, come to grips and get an idea of what people, what was going through people's minds before they had some surgery. I was 32, 1995, when I had my first surgery, and it wasn't even that big of a deal. It sure wasn't like quadruple bypass or brain surgery. And as I said last night, maybe some would say I should have brain surgery, but the first surgery I had was orthoscopic surgery on my knee. We were having a church picnic in Marcus Ann, Wisconsin, and I took a big biff water skiing on Little Green Lake. My knee bothered me. Didn't look that bad. It was a little swollen, but it hurt. It hurt. And it turns out I had to go under the knife a little bit, outpatient surgery, cleaned you up, go home, off you go. A few years later, I had an experience with hernia. Again, you know, looking at it from the outside, didn't look that bad, but obviously something was wrong. What goes on? You go to the doctor and say, oh, you need to have some attention. You need to have a little bit of surgery, outpatient surgery, right? Shh, shh, shh. Off you go, back home, same day. Again, not quadruple bypass, not brain surgery, what have you, but it made me realize that when Mr. Anesthesiologist puts you under to get you ready to have that surgery, whether it's quadruple bypass or orthoscopic knee surgery, man, that is a weird feeling to completely put yourself in somebody else's hands. Here, here's my human life. Take it and fix me up. It's kind of weird. But when you think about that surgery, looking from the outside, a knee, a hernia, quadruple bypass, brain from the outside. How many surgeries happen that really when you look just from the outside, it says, what's the big deal? Doesn't look that bad, doesn't look bad at all, doesn't look like anything's wrong. But when you get the scalpel out, when the doctor, the surgeon gets the scalpel out and does a little cutting and does some exploring in there to see, you see, oh, there's the problem. Oh, that's why you're not feeling well. That's the problem. Let's take care of it. And that picture, that picture of going under the knife, going into surgery in a physical sense also is a pretty good picture of what happens spiritually speaking when we look at the application, the truths of God's word and how it applies to our lives. That this morning we focus our attention on this fact that we as sinners... What a good thing it is for us to go under the knife of God's holy word. That certainly we see that that knife of God's holy word cuts us open, reveals all kinds of things for us in our human lives. And when we realize the value of that sharp knife of God's word, the scalpel of God's word, what an important reminder for us to keep that word, to keep that scalpel as sharp as possible in our everyday lives, under the knife of God's word. Would you follow along going through our texts here this morning, readings from, reading from Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts, the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a, high, a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Our text. I would say it's safe to say everybody in this room this morning didn't wake up, doesn't wake up some morning and say, boy, I've got nothing better to do today than to have some surgery. I think I would like to have surgery just for the sake of having surgery. 
And I get it, there are some people who have elective surgery, they say, oh, I'm going to have a tummy tuck elective surgery. Maybe they think my nose, your nose is too big, I'm going to have my nose made smaller. Okay, elective surgery, but really? Just for the sake of having surgery, I'm going to go through that process, I'm going to go through the painful rehab of having surgery. Something's got to be wrong in order to have surgery, to fix a problem. And this is exactly what the picture is that we have in our text when the writer to the Hebrews writes what he does there about that sharp knife of God's word in verse 12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And this is where we look at this reference that I made before. Sometimes in surgery, right, whether it's a knee or a hernia, the outside, the outside of your or my human body sometimes just looks just fine, but there's obviously something wrong. And this is what the writer to the Hebrews says. It, ju <clears throat> it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You know, you think about the sinful actions that we take, the sin sinful things that we say and that we do, those things that you can see, those obvious sins. It can be very tempting for us as sinners, as Christian sinners, to fall into that trap of saying, well, my sins aren't that big of a deal. My sins aren't as bad as that person's sins. I've never robbed a bank. I've never killed anybody. We can go through that whole checklist of self-evaluating our lives and say, it's not that big of a deal. But when you look at it and are reminded of what the writer to the Hebrews says, boy, that scalpel, that sharp knife of God's word, it judges our thoughts. It judges the attitudes of our hearts. And that's exactly what Jesus says in the Gospel of St. Matthew. He says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Go down that whole list of all those obvious sins that you and I commit every day or don't commit the outward sins. Yet aren't we reminded of the severity, the danger of those sins that happen in my thoughts, right? I break that sixth commandment with my lustful thoughts. I break that fifth commandment with my hateful thoughts, my greed, my laziness. You go through that whole checklist that we did before with those ten commandments and say, okay, yeah, maybe I have never been in prison because I've been arrested for this or that drastic sin against society. But when it comes to God's law, when we come to that scalpel of God's holy word, doesn't that scalpel of the word open up our hearts and reveal, really, the honest truth, what's going on there? How many times you go to the doctor and say, something's wrong, I don't feel good, and the doctor says, oh, try this, try that, we'll do this and do that, and, and nothing, nothing is happening. So sometimes what has to happen? Exploratory surgery, we've got to cut you up, we've got to see what's going on inside. And isn't that true again for us? Always to be humbly honest with ourselves about how we live, what we do and don't do, and how we do break God's law each and every day of our lives, deserving nothing but eternal damnation. This is what the Pharisees just didn't get. And our human natures don't get, quite honestly, because our human natures like to think, well, I can do surgery on myself. I can heal myself. I can do whatever I need to do in order to make God happy and get to heaven, get to an eternal life, if there is a heaven after this life. That's why time after time, in Jesus ministry, he confronted these Pharisees that they looked so good on the outside. They were so proud of themselves, wearing the nice-looking clothes and saying all the right things and doing all these laws and making extra laws that they were relying on themselves to be their own surgeons, to heal themselves. This is where Jesus says to them in Mark chapter 2, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. It's only through that sharp knife of God's word that we realize that. 
that we see that sin, that we have disobeyed that holy, righteous God. And this makes me think of when Peter was preaching his sermon on Pentecost. Remember when there was flames of fire and there was the apostles, disciples were speaking in different languages. 3,000 came to faith that day. And the response, the response of those people in Acts chapter 2. When the people heard this, Peter preaching, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? The scalpel of God's law reveals that, boy, our sinfulness, our disobedience, and in the end, it just does not salve my, my terrible conscience, my conscience that says, I've done things wrong, I've broken the laws, how do I fix it? My, myself says, well, you can fix it yourself, and it just never happens. It never takes care of that guilty conscience until we get to the point of the truth of God's word, the sharp knife of God's word that cuts through all the distraction, that cuts through all the nonsense about eternal salvation, the nonsense that my own brain comes up with. And that sharp knife of God's word also is that great news of the gospel, right? The writer to the Hebrews talks for us, tells us in verses 9 through 11, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. You think about the rest, the Sabbath rest. What was the purpose for that third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. To not get distracted, to keep our, our focused attention on that one thing that happened that gives us rest. Even in the midst of medical problems, all the trials that are going on in life. How is it that each and every Christian has that rest through all the trials of this life, the rest of knowing that our sins are forgiven through Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection, the work of God the Father giving me my daily bread, the work of God the Holy Spirit creating and strengthening my faith. Whew. Isn't that the rest? The rest that gets us through the day, gets us through the week, gets us through to eternal life in heaven? The Sabbath rest that revolves around the great physician, Jesus Christ, defeating sin and Satan. And when it comes to this whole process of a sharp knife, the, the, the sharp knife of God's word cutting through and revealing us our sinfulness, that, that sharp knife of God's word revealing to us that gracious truth of Jesus Christ, our Savior from sin, what a good reminder for us to keep that scalpel, that knife of God's word, as sharp as possible in our lives. I mentioned before, right? Some people tend to think, well, I can take care of my own problems. That's like going to the doctor or saying to the doctor, yeah, I've got a hernia. I know. Thanks for telling me. I'll take care of it. Going home and grabbing a dull butter knife and trying to, to, to solve your own problem, solve your own medical problem. It just won't work. But for us to keep that knowledge of God's word as sharp as we can in our minds so we can keep that application of God's word as sharp as possible as we live our lives. I can't live, I can't, <clears throat> can't remember how to live how God tells me to live unless I remember what he tells me. We review those Ten Commandments. We review, oh, what is it those, those three persons of the Trinity do? Oh, what are the seven things that we're asking for in the Lord's Prayer? To go through that review of Luther's small catechism, those basic doctrines. That's why we do what we do time after time. That's why we gather in God's house, to gather around word and sacrament. That's why we do this Bible class, private devotion thing, all the different ways that our gracious God has given us to keep that knowledge as sharp as possible, to keep that knowledge of God's word in our brains as we live, as we work, as we interact with the, with the people around us. Because Satan is going to keep attacking us, right? The cancer of sin, it keeps affecting us each and every day. 
And so each and every day for my comfort, your own, our own individual comforts, isn't it the greatest thing in the world to be reminded, oh, my sins are forgiven. There is no sin that is too terrible for my gracious Lord to forgive. And so we take comfort in the very last words of our text here where the writer to the Hebrew says, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Hold firmly. Which can only happen through that review, the knowledge that we have of our Savior Jesus Christ. So I know it's a bad illustration, and I shouldn't say bad, I should say kind of an incomplete illustration. But it makes me think that, I, again, reminds me, I'm no surgeon, but every once in a while when I go fishing and every once in a while I catch some fish, it makes me think a little bit about this surgery process that you catch some fish and you're going to eat them, what do you got to do? You got to clean them. You got a bucket full, a stringer full of fish. It's not very helpful to have a dull knife. The first thing that you're going to do before you clean fish is you got to sharpen that knife. And the more fish you have, the more cleaning you do, you got to regularly sharpen that knife to make that cleaning of fish as effective and fast as possible. Same thing. Same picture. Staying sharp with the truths of God's holy word. And I'll sit and I'll agree with the vast majority of you. I don't know who anybody likes to go to the doctor. Anybody who likes to have a physical. At least for me, why do I dread going to a physical? Because the doctor may tell me something I don't want to hear. You've got this problem. You need to be doing that. There's a little bit of fear in there, right? Kind of like the truths of God's word. Sometimes I don't like to hear about my sinfulness. I don't like to hear about my disobedience. But unless that's taken care of, it's going to be a problem throughout the rest of my life. And eventually, if that problem of sin is not taken care of, it leads to the problem of eternal damnation. So what a wonderful blessing, dear friends, right? To have the great physician, Jesus Christ, Give us a diagnosis. He cuts us open with the truth of his law that says, here's the problem, here's your sin. Here's the treatment. Here's the treatment. I'll take care of it for you. I'll, I'll do everything to forgive your sins. And the most wonderful part, the prognosis, the prognosis that says, that great physician Jesus Christ says, everything is forgiven. You have eternal life in heaven. There could be nothing better waiting for you and for me. So it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to go under that knife of God's holy word. It certainly opens us up. It reveals that truth of his law, the truth of our sins, but also, thankfully, the truth of his forgiveness for our sins. And so let's work together. Let's work together to keep that scalpel of God's word as sharp as possible in our lives. Amen. Would you please stand? <clears throat> and now may the grace of God's holy now may the grace of God which surpasses all our human understanding guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach eternal life in heaven amen for our thank offering we're going to roll right into our offering prayer there's a little prayer there and go into as we remind ourselves our thank offerings are part of the worship that we give to our gracious God in our daily lives so let's join together in our offering prayer. We pray. Lord, may we always give our gifts to you as a thank offering for the magnificent gift of Jesus that you so generously gave to us. Make our act of giving to be a blessing and not a burden as we reflect more and more on all you have given us. Make us eager and willing givers from all the gifts you have poured on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our prayers, our responsive prayer, you'll see towards the page, bottom of page 10, keeping some brothers and sisters in, in faith. And just, just to give a, a, a thumbnail sketch, Marlon, Marlon Winter had been in Omaha for uh, quite a while, and just a couple of days ago was um, transferred to the hospital in Osmond. Basically the, s the same situations going on, but uh, uh, Marlon is in Osmond. Uh, Bill Miller uh, has, had, has some back issues too. Uh, and he has been down in Omaha at, at UNMC, and he might be back by now or back tomorrow, but um, he was down in Omaha. Heather Detterman, it wasn't COVID. Um, the words viral meningitis came up, and they, they, again, she said they really don't know what, what's happening, uh, but she is home and, and recouping at home now. And then also, it's not listed, they're not listed in our printed bulletin, but... Uh, Jamie and Pat Jamison celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday, and so we join with them in thanking the Lord for, for the blessings that come with that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. As our lives seem to be filled with busyness and challenges, use your Holy Spirit to keep our attention on Jesus, who perfectly fulfilled your plan of salvation. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution because of their faith. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Gracious God, we know every blessing comes from your gracious and powerful hand. We all thank you for the gift of good health, but when we do need extra medical help, we thank you for the gifts of medicines, doctors and nurses, technology and hospitals. We ask for your guiding and protecting hand as Marlon Winter, Bill Miller, and Heather Detterman receive medical care. Please bless the care and the medicines they receive, and if it is your will, please give these brothers and sisters quick recoveries so that they can return home as soon as possible. And in all circumstances, remind Marlon, Bill, and Heather of the most precious blessing of sins forgiven through Jesus. Most gracious God, we give thanks for the joy and blessings that you give to husbands and wives and their families. Please give extra grace and help to all the spouses and families in our congregation. Strengthen the commitments they made to one another and increase their love for you so that they may grow in their love for one another. As brothers and sisters of Jamie and Pat Jamison, we join in thanking you for blessing them with 50 years of their married lives. Through faith in your grace, open their hearts to receive more and more of your grace as they continue to grow in your word and continue to use and bless them as your faithful servants. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private prayers. Help us to faithfully and selflessly live all of our lives according to your will in all circumstances. Keep us faithful to the truths of your holy word, which guide our daily lives here and now, 
and which thankfully also will bring us to the goal of eternal life in heaven. We ask for these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn this morning. That be hymn 331. Good morning again. Thank you. I'll take that all day long. Uh, a couple of verbal reminders. Uh, Jody asked me to share with you next Sunday, October 31st, would be the last Sunday for uh, the book fair order thing. So if you haven't done already, peruse the books out there and see if any of them uh, might be helpful for you, for you at home, wherever. So book fair today and a week from today, the last two ones. A reminder for the trunks, I don't know what number that, number four, I guess. Uh, need, need more trunks for trunk or treat, is that fair to say, Mr. Brown? Yes, and there is a sign-up sheet if you don't want to sign up online on the table. Okay, uh, a hard copy sign-up sheet out here. I'm guessing you might be around there to answer questions or whatever too. So that's that also is a week from uh, today, uh, October 31st, uh, the afternoon trunk or treat. Which, which makes me think uh, the connection with, with the seminar that we did yesterday. We had 30 people yesterday um, listening to Pastor Vote and, and making us think, get some wheels turning. You know, you know a, a situation like that of, of people coming to our campus, trunk or treat, and, and, and just reminding us as, as Christians of being ready and willing to, to be missionaries in a situation like that. Um, 
whether it's called trunk or treat, whether you call it work, whether you call it recreating, bowling, whatever, with, with whomever, uh, just, just looking for and taking advantage of, of opportunities of, of sharing Jesus with others, and that's one of them. That's one of them. So if you can be helpful and <clears throat> do a trunk and participate and help in other ways, Mr. Brown's the guy to talk to. Um, and then a reminder, we're going to be having a, a congregational voters meeting immediately after this down in the basement, um, starting to make decisions if, right, if there's no decision and it's not, the final decision is not going to happen this morning, but are we going to take some steps to proceed with the possibility of, uh, of, of a building project, of, in, of improving our, our, our capability as a school? Uh, the, the building part of it anyway. So that's going to be discussed and, <clears throat> and what that first uh, step is going to be. Uh, be good to have as many of you as possible down, down in the basement immediately, immediately after this. Is that fair to say down in the basement, Gary? Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else? What's that? I can't hear you. Oh, <laughs> the Wells connection. I need a scalpel in my ear for that. Blessings on your weeks. Hello, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. It's important for every Wells member to know that there's a shortage of pastors, teachers, and staff ministers in our synod with vacant positions all across the country. That means all of us need to do more to encourage young people to consider full-time ministry. And a key part of that effort is ensuring a first-class campus experience at Martin Luther College. Students like Caitlin Butler have a lot of options when considering which college to attend. They look at the coursework, the social atmosphere, and even athletic facilities. It's also nice that we not only get to grow in our faith together, but we also get to um, enjoy some of the other things that we like doing, like sports. Martin Luther College's sports facilities, residence halls, and other buildings have not kept pace with similar schools. And even though Caitlin enrolled at MLC, many of her friends looked elsewhere for their college education, an unfortunate reality that has hurt Martin Luther College's enrollment. You can definitely tell that there's a lot of outdated stuff. And coming from some of my other friends who are at other colleges, you can, you can uh, definitely tell there's a lot of differences uh, between the facilities here at MLC compared to other places. But that's about to change. MLC is building a large indoor practice facility. Many generous gifts laid the financial foundation, and a transformational gift enabled construction to begin. The Betty Cohn Field House features a large artificial turf practice area, batting cages, golf simulators, and locker rooms. This building is going to help our campus recruit and retain uh, those who are going to one day be pastors and teachers and staff ministers. A new residence hall is also in the planning stages. It's part of a larger plan to ensure Martin Luther College nurtures all the gifts of our young people, from musical talent to science skills to leadership skills that flow from on-the-field competition. We simply must provide a campus that speaks to the prospective students of the 21st century. The campaign seeking to jumpstart this campus upgrade is called Equipping Christian Witnesses. It reflects a recognition that we need to support and encourage the promising young people who will lead our church in the future. It makes sense that we as a church body would, would devote a lot of resources and energy to training future gospel ambassadors. Another key aspect of the campaign is increasing financial aid for students so that no one sees the cost of MLC as a roadblock to public ministry. If we can build our financial aid, we can make sure that finances do not stop anyone from pursuing ministry, and especially those who just aren't quite sure and maybe now too easily can look another direction when God's given them those gifts. It's a blessing every time a young person takes a step toward a future in public ministry. 
Our role is to do all we can to encourage them and to help provide the top flight college experience that demonstrates our love for our students and for people who need to hear about our Savior. Construction on the new Betty Cohn Field House at Martin Luther College is well underway, and it should be ready for use in just a couple of months. If you would like to follow the construction and participate in the effort, go to the website on your screen or contact our Wells Ministry of Christian Giving at 800-827-5482. Lessons on your weeks.